May I invite you to remain standing for the invocation. Almighty Lord, we offer our prayers to you in the assurance that you hold us all in your love and hear us. With great joy this morning, we honor your sons and daughters who will graduate today from Boston College Law School. They have touched all of our lives. We are filled with joy as we celebrate their achievements. We pray in gratitude for, to you for your blessings upon our graduates. We pray for their parents, spouses, children, relatives, and friends. Their constant and generous love has sustained our graduating class during all the years of their lives. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to confer your gifts of compassion and wisdom upon our graduates, that they may serve society with honor. Make them courageous in confronting any wrong, and yet discerning of the paths of peace and reconciliation. Grant them the abilities and opportunities to reach out to serve the neglected, the needy, and the rejected in our communities who call out for justice or simple understanding. Fill the hearts and minds of our graduates with zeal for all that is true, noble, just, deserving of love, and worthy of praise. Enable them always, encourage them always with the knowledge that you walk with them on the journey of life. May your wisdom be firmly rooted in their hearts so that they may bring forth in our land a rich harvest of truth, justice, and peace. Today especially, may you, O Holy One, fill them with joy and a well-deserved pride in their accomplishments. We offer our prayer to you in confidence and trust for we live in the shelter of your love and fidelity, now and forever. Amen. And I, I invite you to remain standing for the national anthem, and I invite Elizabeth Cole of our graduating class, who will now sing for us that national anthem. Please be seated. Father Leahy, 
Provost Quigley, distinguished guests, particularly our commencement speaker, Congressman Bobby Scott, spouses, children, family and friends of our graduates, and on this very special day, members of the Boston College Law School class of 2019. Thank you for joining us at this commencement celebration. I'm pleased to welcome you, our new graduates, into the ranks of the legal profession. As I know you've heard many times today, and I suspect you will continue to hear throughout the day, we are all very, very proud of you. Graduates, as you prepare to launch your careers this commencement day, I thought it would be appropriate to spend a few minutes reflecting on the rule of law, both here and around the world. I recently traveled to Uzbekistan in the heart of Central Asia. Its capital city, Tashkent, lies along the famed Silk Road. Modern day Uzbekistan is both the steward of this ancient global crossroads of culture and trade, and the brave harbinger of what the region's future could look like under the rule of law. BC Law recently formed a partnership with Uzbekistan's premier law school, the Tashkent State University of Law, the first American law school in that country's history to do so. For well over a century, the people of Uzbekistan lived under Russian colonial and Soviet domination, and when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, a newly independent Uzbekistan continued to be ruled by its autocratic Soviet-era president. In December 2016, a new leader came to power with a different vision for the country's future. Boston College Law School is assisting Uzbekistan to become a modern nature integrated into the global economy and operating under the rule of law. Over the next generation, major reforms that have been launched over the past two years will need to take hold in Uzbekistan's educational, political, and legal systems to move the country forward. Our involvement with the people of Uzbekistan is a reminder of the extraordinary hardships that many around the world have endured in their quest to gain even a few of the privileges we take for granted. It also offers a warning against complacency. What we have built as a democratic nation under the rule of law is precious and increasingly at risk. Just a couple of weeks ago, the Prime Minister of Hungary, Viktor Orban, was a guest of President Trump at the White House. Orban has worked to undermine democracy in Hungary by rewriting the Constitution, gerrymandering the electoral map, exerting control over the media, and weakening the courts. Many observers believe that Orban is skillfully using law and democratic freedoms to fan ethnic nationalism and to drive Hungary back into authoritarianism. As BC Law works closely with a nation that is looking to the United States as a model of how to move away from totalitarianism and toward democracy, it bears considering whether our own uh, democratic house is in order. With every heap of praise our current administration offers authoritarian leaders around the world, it becomes increasingly difficult to discern the depth of our president's commitment to the rule of law here at home. Hungary reminds us that democratic institutions can be subverted from within by a head of state bent on expanding and consolidating his power. Uzbekistan provides a counterexample of a new leader actually using the authoritarian power of his office to open his nation to democratic and ec economic reform. The legal foundations that have served as a bedrock for our country since its birth are being tested. But as members of the legal profession, we cannot be complacent, nor should we lose hope. The ability of Americans to withstand attack from within and without depends on our willingness to approach our responsibilities as citizens with the utmost seriousness, to call out destructive anti-democratic behavior, and to support the efforts of those around the world who seek to liberate themselves from tyranny. As you receive your diplomas today, I encourage you to reflect on where our nation has been, where it is now, and on what it will become. Consider the two models of Uzbekistan and Hungary. Remember the centrality of equal justice for all to the security and endurance of our democracy, and never fail to recognize both the power 
and responsibility you wield as Boston College lawyers. Years from now, I hope you will be able to reflect back on lives and careers that strengthen the power of the rule of law and our system of justice. I hope you will have continued the work of those who have sacrificed so that we might continue to be worthy stewards of the values and traditions of our democracy that we hold dear. Congratulations, class of 2019. It is now my pleasure to introduce Father William P. Leahy of the Society of Jesus, President of Boston College, who will offer welcoming remarks. Father Leahy. Dean Rougeau, Congressman Scott, members of the faculty and staff, parents, spouses, and guests here in Conti Forum this morning, and especially the 2019 graduates of the Boston College Law School. On behalf of the entire Boston College community, I welcome everyone here to this graduation ceremony. This is a day where we can think back in gratitude, we can recall many gifts, and we also know about the work that has gone into the lives of our graduates who have pursued legal education. Earning a law degree is not easy. It's a journey requiring discipline, motivation, a level of academic ability, and much support. And it occurs to me, it's fitting this morning, if I ask all of our graduates to stand and turn toward those who are here today and thank them for the ways in which they received a great deal of support. So if you graduates would stand with me, turn to our guests, and let's give everyone who is a guest here today a round of applause. Thank you all. As Dean Rougeau noted, there are a range of issues facing our world today in regard to how we live, how we treat one another. It's very evident to me that the graduates of the Boston College Law School that join the workforce that will go and do many things will greatly assist the revitalization of society, not only in the United States, but around the world. Each of our graduates today has benefited and given so much from their moments, their years at the Boston College Law School. Since its founding in 1929, the law school here has strived to prepare attorneys who are compassionate, engaged, who are well prepared for legal careers, and who are committed to the highest professional and ethical standards. We need these individuals to go forth and continue in their dreams and their aspirations. We need attorneys who are guided by a sense of ethics and care for the vulnerable, who strive to protect legal and human rights, who work for justice, and who know and respect the rule of law, foundational to our nation and democracy. The law has always been and remains a noble profession, and a meaningful way to serve and do good, to work for the greater glory of God. Today reminds us to look back 
in thanksgiving, savor the achievements bringing us to Conti Forum today, and then consider the opportunities and challenges in the days and years ahead. This ceremony calls us to remember those people and ideas shaping our lives still. And then to rededicate ourselves to using our experiences, education, and personal gifts to help the less fortunate. May God especially bless you graduates of the Boston College Law School with us this morning. And may you be enabled to share your many talents and skills with people wherever you are. My congratulations and best wishes. And thank you for being part of Boston College. Good morning. It is my pleasure to welcome and congratulate our 2019 graduates on behalf of the law school faculty. As your teachers during the three years of law school, it is our real pleasure to be here today to see you reach this last step in your legal education at Boston College. Graduations have two distinct purposes. First, there are moments to reflect on and appreciate one's hard work and success in completing an important phase uh, in education. That is very much what we are doing here today, having friends, family, faculty, and staff join you in celebrating. Second, they are a moment, a perfect moment with a captive audience to share suggestions for the future. Uh, in considering what to say, uh, during what I assure you will be very brief moments at the podium, I thought about some of the advice that I've heard my colleagues and others offer. Building on that, I thought I would offer three suggestions today. First, be yourself, but be yourself at your best. Perhaps you understand yourself primarily as a bold nonconformist. You challenge every norm, every rule. Or perhaps you prefer to work more quietly from within systems. There is a place for all of these variations in the law. Okay? But the mantra, be yourself, is only half of what you should strive for. Yes, you do want to be yourself, but be the best version of that self. Second, your good name once lost. Okay? Well, even if that phrase or famous variance thereof overstates the risk. It captures a truth about one of the most valuable assets you have, your reputation. You now have one, but as you enter practice or pursue a path beyond the practice of law that builds on your legal education, you will be establishing your reputation. This is true in both large and small ways. Are you reliable? Do you say and do what you mean? Do you treat others with respect? Are you really doing your work? Do legal adversaries respect you? If they do, you are both skilled at your work and you are professionally and personally credible over the long haul. It sounds so obvious and mundane as to be trite, perhaps, but the reality is that not everyone does, in fact, conduct themselves according to such principles. Bottom line, if you accept a job, a role, a task, then while you have it, you should approach it in a manner that reflects well on and builds your good name. You cannot control everything in life, but you have significant control over this. Exercise it well. Third, Engage in periodic reflection on your career. Two key words here, periodic and reflection. First, to reflection. 
It can be easy as life gets busy to start down a path and allow it to propel you forward, a bit like a stream. You do want to stop and ask yourself whether there are changes you would like to make. A different role, a different firm, a different sector, a different location. Are your dreams different than they were upon graduation? But remember the second word, periodic. If you reevaluate your professional life on a daily, weekly, or even monthly basis, you will find yourself consumed by such introspection and won't be able to dive into your work. Instead, think about asking yourself these questions on perhaps an annual basis, kind of like a professional tune-up. As you are heading into, say, a next year, are there things you would like to change in your work life? New goals, big or small? Can you map out a strategy to make them happen? As your faculty here at the law school, we have every confidence that an exciting, productive, and valuable career in the law awaits you. And we look forward to hearing from you in the future. And of course, we are always here as a resource. We congratulate you and wish you the very best. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Congressman Robert Scott. A graduate of BC Law, Congressman Scott has been recognized by the Hill newspaper as one of the top 25 hardest working members of Congress. He has represented Virginia's third congressional district since 1993, the first African American elected to Congress from the Commonwealth of Virginia since Reconstruction, and only the second African American elected to Congress in Virginia's history. He's also the first American with Filipino ancestry to serve as a voting member of Congress. As chairman of the Committee on Education and Labor, he is advancing an agenda, an agenda that improves equity in education, frees students from the burdens of crippling debt, protects and expands access to affordable health care, ensures workers have a safe workplace where they can earn a living wage free from discrimination, and guarantees seniors have a secure and dignified retirement. From 2015 to 2018, he was a ranking member of the Committee on Education and the Workforce and was one of four primary authors of the Every Student Succeeds Act. Congressman Scott also worked to secure passage of legislation to reform and update the nation's career and technical education system. He serves on the Committee on the Budget, where he is a leading voice on fiscal policy and reducing the def deficit. Congressman Scott is also a recognized champion of the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights. On matters of crime, terrorism, and homeland security, he sponsored the Death in Custody Reporting Act and led efforts in the House to pass the Fair Sentencing Act. One of the first successful reductions in a mandatory minimum sentence in decades. He also co-authored the Safe, Accountable, Fair, and Effective Justice Act, which has been recognized as one of the most comprehensive criminal justice reform bills in a generation. Congressman Scott is a strong supporter of military readiness, as well as troops and their safety. He himself served in the Massachusetts National Guard and the United States Army Reserve. A native of Washington, D.C., Congressman Scott is a graduate of Harvard College and Boston College Law School. Before his election to Congress, he was a member of the Virginia House of Delegates from 1978 to 1983, and the Senate of Virginia from 1983 to 1993. Please give a warm welcome to our 2019 commencement speaker, Robert C. Bobby Scott. Thank you, Dean Rougeau, for your very kind introduction. Father Leahy, members of the Board of Trustees, faculty and staff, parents, relatives, and friends, we are all here to honor and to congratulate the Boston College Law School class of 2019. Give them a hand. You know, looking out at our graduates, I can't uh, help but think about how much times have changed since I was in your shoes at Boston College. I graduated in 19. 
73. Uh, the campus, was, the law school was on the main campus. I think it uh, moved uh, in the late 70s. And uh, there were, Father Leahy has um, mentioned many of the things that were going on today, and the same things going on back then. It, we were trying to get out of a war. The Vietnam War had been there a long time. And the Watergate hearings were going on. Uh, trying to see if the president had committed impeachable offenses. We're still trying to get out of a war, and uh, who knows what's going to happen to the president. But one thing has not changed, and that is that Boston College has remained a premier institution with a long history of excellence, and you're leaving here with some of the best legal, legal training that this country has to offer. And the time and energy it took for you to earn your law degree is a metaphor but lessons I learned in my experience in public, ser public service. Meaningful achievements do not happen suddenly, and they do not happen without the help and support of others. You are here today because of countless hours that you spent attending lectures, briefing cases, building your understanding of the law. You are here today because of thousands of individuals uh, that, that helped you and the individual decisions you made to sacrifice for a long-term goal. And you're here because the people in this arena who supported you when you struggled, congratulated you when you succeeded, and tolerated you when you were stressed out. Let's, uh, <clears throat> uh, unfortunately, in today's social media, the culture of capturing, sharing, and cultivating the highlights of your lives has, a, has the effect of erasing, or at least concealing, the work required to produce moments of triumph. Each time you pick up your phone, for example, you're reminded that someone, somewhere, is doing something remarkable. As a result, we increasingly see moments of achievement as spontaneous without any apparent effort. The fear of missing out on this spontaneous achievement, which my young staffers refer to as FOMO. Now, how many people here know what FOMO means? Okay, fear of missing out. That can be crippling. Now, this is not a critique of the younger millennium uh, generation. Each generation has its own unique challenges. Your generation's challenge is not to allow social media culture to distract or divert you from the meaningful work you're called on to do. But if you li live in, according to this institution's strong commitment to the Jesuit values, and if you advocate for human rights, social justice, and public interest law, you will find the real progress inherently requires arduous and collaborative work. As a member of Congress, I know a little bit about that struggle of policy making, and I can tell you, do you, you do not make policy by tweets. The arduous work of policy making consists of long committee hearings, countless town halls, and multiple drafts of a single bill, and none of which, none of that work will you see on your Twitter account or on Facebook but the accomplishments in real life take work. For example, I've been fighting, as the dean said, I've been fighting to reform the criminal justice system since my first election to the Virginia House of Del Delegates a long time ago. And let me tell you a secret. Criminal justice policy and reforming criminal justice system is not complicated, but you have to make a choice. You can choose to follow the evidence and research and reduce crime and save money, or you can play politics by codifying sound bites and slogans. Once you've made the, that decision, the rest is easy. But unfortunately, our response to crime for decades has been the wrong choice. Slogans, sound bites, fear mongering. The 1986 Anti Drug Abuse Act set draconian mandatory minimums for drug offenses, including a five year mandatory minimum sentence for possessing a weekend's worth of crack. It passed the House 392 to 16, passed the Senate 97 to 2. Eight years later, during my first term in the House of Representatives, we passed the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act, better known as the Clinton Crime Bill. This bill accelerated uh, harsher sentences, created 60 new death penalties, and encouraged states to abolish parole. It passed, but um, it did nothing to reduce crime, and it was so bad that President Clinton doesn't even bother to defend it now. But as a result of these bills and other slogans and sound bites codified in the law, the United States 
despite representing only 5% of the world's population, has 25% of the world's prisoners, and locks up a higher portion of its population than any country on Earth by far. The studies, of, um, uh, studies and evidence show that incarceration rates above 350 people per 100,000 is actually any incarceration rate higher than that, 350, is actually counterproductive, actually increases crime because you've got too many children being raised by parents in jail, you've got too many people with felony records that can't find jobs, and you're using too much of the, of the federal budget or state budget that could be used effectively for prevention-based programs, you're wasting on prisons that aren't doing anything. Over 350 per 100,000. Our incarceration rate is about 700 per 100,000. And if that's and what's worse, some states lock up minorities at the rate of almost 4,000 per 100,000. That policy makes no sense unless you have deliberately chosen to ignore the evidence and research and decide to play politics by being soft, by being tough on crime. Fortunately, things are changing. In 2007, I introduced the Youth Promise Act, which was an ambitious proposal to keep young people out of the criminal justice system by giving local communities money to implement their own comprehensive, evidence-based crime prevention and early intervention programs. As so often is the case, meaningful in, with meaningful legislation in Congress, the Youth Promise Act not only failed to make it out of committee, we didn't even get a hearing. But, in fact, the Youth Promise Act did pass, did, it did not pass for almost a decade, but over that time, crime policy has begun to shift. So policymakers saw the benefits of following the evidence and research. Started back in Texas a few years ago when state lawmakers were told that they needed to come up with an additional, additional $2 billion to fund the Department of Corrections to keep up with the growing, uh, the growing prison population. State lawmakers decided to choose another path. They spent about 10% of that, about 200, 200 million, not 2 billion, to um, invest in evidence-based prevention, early intervention, and rehabilitation strategies. That investment was so effective that it not only eliminated the need to build new prisons, it actually allowed them to close some of the prisons they had. So by 2015, conservative groups started to pick up the mantle of criminal justice reform just because of the massive cost savings and joint forces of progressive and civil rights groups that have been demanding reform for years. Now, during this time, I ascended to the top Democratic position on the Education Committee and took advantage of that position. When we renewed the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act, I made sure that the provisions of the Youth Promise Act were actually put into the bill. So when the bill passed and was signed into law 2018, the Youth Promise Act, the provisions of that bill are now in the law of the land. And now other legislators are also choosing to follow the evidence and research and over, uh, over sound bites and slogans, and we're making progress on criminal justice reform. As Martin Luther King once said, human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable. Every step forward, every step towards the goal of justice requires sacrifice, suffering, and struggle, and the tireless exertions and passionate concern of dedicated individuals. In your life, both personally and professional, you'll be, you'll be tempted to choose the easier path. But when faced with temptation to take that easier route, I hope you remember the Jesuit pr principles that Boston College Law School seeks to, seeks to instill in each of its students. That is, public service, social justice, and a commitment to excellence. Perhaps nobody embodies these principles more than Father Robert Drynan, the former dean of the law school, a Jesuit priest, and five-term member of Congress. As a member of Congress, Father Drynan was a powerful voice for the poor and disadvantaged, and he was guided by a sense of morality rooted in the Jesuit tradition. He once said that there's a common core of moral and religious beliefs, and frankly, we are in total violation of that. We're supposed to be good to the poor, we have more poor children in America than any other industrialized nation. We're supposed to love prisoners and help them. We have 2.1 million people in prison, the largest of any country on earth. We also allow 11 children to be killed every day. All of the religions are opposed to that. That's violence 
Why don't we organize on that? That's the question that still resonates with us today. And as you know well, systemic inequalities continue to bar underserved Americans from equal access to education, health care, employment, even basic necessities. Yet our political environment continues to devolve into televised spectacles, short-sighted policies, personal animosity, and we so much need not to get distracted by that concern. We must always remember that progress is the result of consistent commitment to hard work and a focus on priorities. Just as you worked hard in law school, you must work hard to expand access to education, health care, to strengthen voting rights, and perhaps even reform our criminal justice system. Now, as I close, I want to leave you with the words of the late Massachusetts Senator Edward Brooke, who delivered the commencement address to Wellesley College in 1969. In words that still ring true today, he said, this country has profound and pressing social problems on its agenda. It needs the best energies of all of its citizens, especially its gifted young people, to remedy these ills. Let us not dissipate these energies on phony issues or misguided missions. Let us not mistake the vigor of protest for the value of accomplishment. Let us direct the zeal of every concerned American to the real problems. Let us forsake false drama for true endeavor. Let us, in short, recognize that ours is a precious community that demands and delivers the best that is in all of us. Graduates, I can't wait to see the best in all of you. Our future is brighter because you have taken the right path. Thank you, and congratulations to the Boston College class of 2019. To our friends at the Tashkent State University of Law and all our friends in Uzbekistan, I want to wish a blessed Ramadan Mubarak. I'd like to call the members of the LLM class. Simon Marie Albert Lebrun. Fei Hongbo, Susanna Ferim Perez, Yamit Shavrit Geldman, Chaukat Ghazal, Jeffrey Gilberg, Majda Ashimi, Lee Kyung Te. Liliana Mamani Condori, Caterina Molinari, Teresa Oriani, Elise Postel, Shen Jin Chung, Emma Vincent, Wang Zhe, Tsung Chir. Now I have the pleasure of uh, the, uh, let's uh, start with the class, uh, the JD candidates uh, for the class of 2019. If you want to come forward. Bijan Abe, Samuel Len Agostini, Michael S. Ahn, Lynn Cochran Allen, cum laude, Lauren Dowden Allen, cum laude, Timothy Andrea, 
magna cum laude. Thomas James Endrick uh, Kopoulos. Alexander N. Apostolaris. Daniel W. Armas. David Michael Armas. Samuel Vincent Escanio. Carlos Manuel Badiola. Catherine Eliza Bailey Sullivan. Madison A. Ball. Alexander Michael Beals. Omar Benani. Alexis Leigh Berglund, cum laude. Michael S. Berry. Samantha Ann Bate, cum laude. Evan D. Bloom, cum laude. Allison K. Blum. Emma Bernadette Bola, summa cum laude. Alexander Feeman Booker. Alexander Augusti Bo Rhodes, magna cum laude. Jennifer Ann Bowers, cum laude. Molly Taylor Boyd. Luke Martin Breckenridge. Tyler Charles Brown. Yatunde Viraimo. Leanne Butterfield. Virginia J. Calistro. Michael R. Casagrande, cum laude. Jade Alexandra Castro. Michael A. Cavuto. Elizabeth Yolanda Che. Navid Chirachi. Hai Yun Cho. Michelle Han Young Cho. Wan Yul Cho. Ellen Choi. Su Yun Choi. Patrick T. Chapjack. Michael Joseph Klopp, cum laude. Nicole Elizabeth Kokui. Elizabeth Jill Cole. Jesse R. Coulon, cum laude. Curtis Neil Cranston, magna cum laude. Christopher Crocker. Eleanor L. Doherty. Victoria Madeline Dawes. Lisa C. Diocutis. Carlo J. DeHart. Hadiya Khan Deshmukh. Timothy Patrick Devlin. Peter Conrad Diliberti, magna cum laude. Colin Alejandro Dilly.
Natasha Lisa De Dobrot, magna cum laude. Nicholas Orion Dodson. Samuel Hayes Doherty, cum laude. Devon Carlin Dre. Chen Fai Du. Yintian Duan. Hannah Teresa Dudley, cum laude. Adam T. Durham. Elizabeth Dwyer. Ethan A. Eastwood. Elizabeth Rosenberg Ellis. Hannah Rose Eskenazi, cum laude. Caroline Blakeney Evans. Haley Elizabeth Evans. Gabriella Marie Falcone, cum laude. Edward Clark Faust. Harry Feinberg. Brandon H. Farrick, summa cum laude. Mariah Elena Filiette Vasquez, cum laude. Allison Nicole First, cum laude. Connor Tully Flynn. Michael Joseph Foley, cum laude. Zachary Ryan Fountas, cum laude. Kevin Benjamin Frankel. Antonio Giovanni Freoni. Jared D. Friedberg. Shannon E. Galvin. Niccolo Grandini. Abigail M. Garahan. John Lewis Gavin, magna cum laude. Eric Christopher Giebert, cu cum laude. Mohammed Zuer Gazaiwi. Jesse R. Gibbings. Amy Lee Goodman, summa cum laude. Haley S. Grisson, cum laude. Amber Catherine Groves. Nicholas Ronald Gunton. Ryan P. Hallisey. Elliot Robert Hamilton. Daniel Haydar. Rebecca Theodora Hayes, magna cum laude. Oscar Tao He. Yi Chen He. Leah Marie Hangemuel, magna cum laude. Mark J. Hidleyan Jr. Todd Gregory Hobbs, Mary Hadley Holmes, Imran Hossein, Benjamin Manho Hoy, Susan S. Swang, Romani Brujimo, cum laude. Shilpa Iyer. J. 
Jennifer Lauren Jacobs. John Jameson. Thomas Jag, cum laude. Hannah Rose Jelinek. Brandon Bennett Jewart. Daniel D. Johnson. Elizabeth T. Johnson. Stephanie N. Johnson, cum laude. Emily Sarah Joseph. Margo Celeste Joslow, magna cum laude. Faria Binte Kabir. Sun Kulp Kundaswamy. Samuel J. Knusher. Paul Raymond Kotsimovsky. Matthew Scott Kirker. Srish Kakarel, magna cum laude. Daewoo Kim. Matthew J. King. Megan Patricia King, cum laude. Zachary Alexander Klein, cum laude. Adam Joseph Kleinfeld. Michael J. Koh, cum laude. Garubed Kupsherian, cum laude. Brooke Ashley Kutman, cum laude. Lauren Ann Coster, cum laude. Anastasia Curtis Kirkavellos. Alexis Margaret Prahl, cum laude. Min Jung Kwok. Maria Lamour, Samuel Landman, Margaret Anthony Lachese, cum laude, Annie Elaine Lee, magna cum laude, Richard Lee, Benjamin Charles Lees, cum laude, Angie Lee, Diana Lee, Aishwarna in the Maye, magna cum laude, Fredo Yuji Lee, Edwin William Link the Fifth. Wallace Rianne Linker, cum laude. Hannah Beth Lipman. Ian Baker Logi, cum laude. Matthew Eugene Anthony Lorini. Catherine Alyssa Moss, cum laude. Connor Augustus McIsaacs. Hunter Post Malaski Summa Cum Laude. Timothy V. Malley Cum Laude. Peter Joseph Mandich. Weslin Nikathana Manupalai Cum Laude. Christopher 
Marks. Brianna Kate Marshall. Hale B. McAnulty. Morgan Elizabeth McDonald. Sean Patrick McKinley. Kaylee Aaron McGlynn, magna cum laude. Brendan Ellett McGow. Brendan James McKinnon. Thomas Brandon McLaughlin, magna cum laude. Siobhan Teresa McNulty, cum laude. Sumanjit Mime. Pooja R. Mehta. Edward Stapleton Melanson. Michael Thomas Melchiore. Mary Rose Mesa. John Paul Christian Mildy, cum laude. Tyler David Mills, magna cum laude. Christina Mison Min. Marissa Ann Mugio. Marcus Raymond Namath. Joseph Matthew Norenya, cum laude. Rohan K. Ori, cum laude. Terence Robert Olson, cum laude. Samantha Logan O'Neill. Matthew O'Neill, cum laude. Nathan Y. Hack. Niha Parikh. Ji Hoon Park. Nyesong Park. Jeremy Harris Pepper, cum laude. Richard Nicholas Perkins. Kiana S. Phillips. Vasundra Prasad, cum laude. Sean Chuju. Tyler Random Quiznell. Griffin Edward Quist. Kayla Marie. Rathjen. Jasmine Patricia Reed, magna cum laude. Caroline Riley. Claudia Andrea Restrepo. Madeline R. Rowe, cum laude. Catherine Rosati, cum laude. Jordan Patrick Rose. Jacqueline Page Rosen, magna cum laude. Lauren V. Rossman. Allison Lewis Rubin. Joshua Max Rubin. Erica N. Ryan. Tara Santusuoso. Matthew Alex Sawyer. Joseph Anthony Sabaro. Randall Alexander Scarlett. Matthew David Sherbarth. Julia A. Schwartz. 
Jane Elizabeth Schwed. Devin Robert Sheehan, cum laude. Megan Irene Suzolski. Jason B. Sitomer. Anna Z. Skipper, cum laude. Macy S. Smith. Christina Mary Sonageri, magna cum laude. Ryan Charles Somberg, cum laude. Brian Nelson Sprout, Jr., cum laude. Stephen Stanley Starziak, Jr. Victoria Stern. Lauren P. Stewart, summa cum laude. Landon Douglas Stinson, cum laude. Josephine M. Stoner. Lichu Ton, cum laude. Emily Brantley Tate, magna cum laude. Kaze Dalkeith Thomas. Brian Thomas, cum laude. Olivia Lyon Veslich. Julian Abraham Vixman. Dylan M. Velescus. Ting Yu Wong. Christopher Farron Warren, cum laude. Nolan Michael Weber. Jenna Michelle Wiseman. Ryan Thomas Wellwood. Catherine Elizabeth Weston, magna cum laude. Colin Jordan Wetmore. John F. White III. Dana E. Wooten. Andrew Pax Yarrows, cum laude. Sua Yoon. Bianca M. Young. Truja Yu. Sai Zhang. Shi Rei Zhong. applause for the class of 1st award is the Susan Grant de Marais Award for Public Service Achievement and Leadership. Our Susan Grant de Marais winner is Lauren Coster. <laughs> Lauren is a public service scholar who was president of the Public Interest Law Foundation, PILF, and chair of the PILF Auction. 
She has been a distinguished leader and law student who has been committed to public service and the highest ideals of law. In addition to serving as president of PILF, she excelled at many clinical and academic ventures. She was a law review student with a published article, a Rappaport Fellow, and a full year student in the Juvenile Rights Advocacy Program. In JRAP, Lauren distinguished herself both in her work and her cases and in her depth of thinking and analysis. In her two years as PILF president, she showed extraordinary commitment to supporting BC Law's public interest community through her leadership with PILF that has gone far beyond the auction and raising funds for summer stipends. Under Lauren's leadership, over the past two years, PILF expanded programming and opportunities for law students to find support and opportunities in public interest. Lauren's leadership style gently brought all team members along to her way of thinking and cultivated an environment in which the whole group worked beyond their own perceived abilities. As one of her nominators commented, I can think of no one more deserving of this award than the person who has dedicated her career and these past three years to the betterment of the organization that represents service and public interest at BC. After graduation, Lauren will clerk for the Honorable Paul Barbadoro of the United States District Court in New Hampshire. Congratulations, Lauren. Our next award is the St. Thomas More Award for the student who exemplifies the intellectual, spiritual, and moral qualities of St. Thomas More. One of our highest honors, the St. Thomas More Award, is named for a Catholic saint who famously put his devotion to faith and morality above a love of worldly power and position. This year's St. Thomas More Award winner is Michael Foley. Michael, a double eagle, has demonstrated that he is truly a person for others in everything he does. He has been a spiritual leader of the St. Thomas More Society, a leader on the sidebar retreat, a dedicated student attorney in the criminal defense clinical program, a willing helper to many student organizations, and an always friendly, cheerful, and energetic presence around the law school. From, a, from spiritual reflection to softball, he has been a valued leader. <laughs> in addition, during his third year of law school, Mike devoted himself to assisting indigent, accused, and convicted persons, going beyond the narrow bounds of professional duty. He volunteered repeatedly to represent inmates who found themselves in disciplinary trouble in the prisons, and then realizing that many poor and incarcerated persons did not have decent clothing to wear to their court appearances, he initiated a clothing drive on campus. In the words of one of his nominators, St. Thomas More would have been proud to have his name linked with Michael Foley's, and in the words of another nominator, as, B as the BC saying goes, truly a man for others. After graduation, Michael will join the law firm of Choate Hall and Stewart LLP here in Boston. Congratulations, Michael. Our next award is the Philip Joseph Privatera Class of 95 Commencement Award for exceptional contributions through scholarship and commitment to service. The Privetera Award recognizes an individual who is an extraordinary student leader as well as an excellent scholar. Our award winner this year is Stephanie Johnson. <laughs> Stephanie, who graduates today cum laude, with a Juris Doctor degree and a Master of Arts degree in Urban Planning and Environmental Policy, has been an outstanding student academically and a leader since starting law school. Stephanie has served as an articles editor of the Boston College Law Review, a fellow for the Rappaport Center for Law and Public Policy, co-president and community service chair of the Black Law Student Association. She helped plan and lead the annual BC Law Public Interest Law Retreat and our sidebar retreat. As co-president of BALSA, she helped transform the group's presence and impact on campus and the community. She created the Interview Suit Drive, the Know Your Rights Training with the National Lawyers Guild, and other new and innovative programs and resources for BALSA members. 
and more important, she mentored those, fo those to follow so they would be ready to step into leadership roles. In the words of one of her professors, Stephanie is a formidable intellect, a prodigious worker, a courageous leader, and a conscientious and insightful human being. In class, she was always prepared, asked incisive questions, and made proactive points. Stephanie embodies the qualities of courage, magnanimity, leadership, and intellect that this award was created to reward and engender. After graduation, Stephanie will join the law firm of Klein Honig, where she will work in the field of affordable housing and community development. Congratulations, Stephanie. The final award is the Attorney Michael A. Flanagan Award for Highest Academic Rank. This year's valedictorian, graduating summa cum laude with a grade point average of 3.843, is Brandon Ferrick. Brandon served as executive articles editor on the Boston College Law Review. In this position, he was in charge of selecting articles for the review and supervising the publication process thereafter. His own writing on using blockchain tech for corporate record keeping drew broad notice in the field after it was picked up on Twitter. Brandon also organized the review's day of service event at St. Francis House. After graduation, Brandon will join the law firm of Sullivan and Cromwell in New York. Congratulations, Brandon. I'd now like to invite the LSA president, Marcus Nimeth, to the podium. Thank you, Dean Rougeau, uh, Father Leahy, Congressman Scott, faculty, uh, students, uh, family members, and most importantly, this class of 2019. What a journey it has been for us, a long, arduous, intense three years. Whether you're one of the K through JDs, one of the ones who took some time off between your degrees to do whatever millennial 20-somethings do nowadays, or one of the people that took that leap of faith to start a whole new career, we have all earned this celebratory moment. As law students, we rarely had time to pause and reflect between reading a dizzying amount of case law preparing for on-campus job interviews, or just simply preparing for the stressful exams that 1Ls usually have to go through. But a lot has happened in the world outside of our small law school bubble, so I wanted to spend some time reflecting since 2019, or excuse me, since 2016. We witnessed the first complete solar eclipse in almost four decades on this planet, or in the United States. That was pretty amazing. We saw the unfolding of the European Union as the United Kingdom decided to take its Brexit steps. The Syrian refugee crisis captivated millions across the globe as we saw photo after photo to remind us of how truly lucky we are to be here. In the era of millions watching television at the same exact time ended in a bittersweet moment this weekend as Game of Thrones finished its finale. But in many ways, much of the world has stayed the same since 2016. For instance, the Red Sox and the Patriots have dominated championships in Boston, giving us, <laughs> yes, 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 giving us the opportunity to miss class on three separate occasions for parades in downtown Boston. Um, since 2006, uh, excuse me, since 2016, you can still find Professor Bloom and Professor Broden at any law school event that serves snacks or food in general. The Golden State Warriors have still yet to miss an NBA Finals appearance. No, no. And surprisingly, the legal profession remains mostly closed to members of our most marginalized communities. In 2016, I entered BC Law as the lone African-American male of a 250-person class. 
I bet if the graduating Congressman Scott in 1973 was asked how many black males would be in the 2016 class of Boston College Law School, I bet he would not say one. And to be honest, I entered this institution a skeptic as I looked around at all the faces that were unfamiliar to me on orientation day. However, I graduate today so proud to have all of you in my miss. We got a couple other transfers and doubled our numbers. <laughs> and I'm so proud to be here solely because of every single person in this Boston College Law community. It was members of RBC community who decided to join other students, professors, attorneys, and activists outside of Logan Airport at 2 a.m. when the newly instituted immigration ban was dropped down. It is our community that collectively contributes to the 3L class gift to contribute enough money to annually fund three public service graduates after they become BC law students. It was our community who trusted that lone black male and voted me the president of the law student organization. And I want to be really clear about this last one, especially for our 2019 grads. It was solely, solely the 2017 graduating class that caused the boat cruise disturbance and solely the 2017 class that had our disastrous event at the Smith and Wellensee Castle. And it was not us, I promise you. And although three years may seem like a lifetime ago to us, our journey to get to the celebratory point did not start in August 2016. Our respective upbringings took a lot of grit, a lot of dedication, and the support of an entire village for all of us to be here today. I want you all to look around you and look in the stands and see all of the faces of family members, significant others, professors, teachers, friends, and just mentors that all contributed some sort of contributing role for us to be here today as a successful BC Law class of 2019. And when I look into the audience, I see my village. I see my single mother who sacrificed so much, entirely provided a life of opportunity for me and my little sisters. I see my fiance, sisters, grandparents, aunts, uncles, soon to be in-laws. I look in the crowd and I see so many familiar faces that I've made new friends over the last three years here at BC Law. And with our village's support, we all leave this institution as the next generation, determined to make change and leave the door wide open so those that come after us have a less arduous path. And as we conclude this commencement and continue to celebrate our achievements, I ask that we all look back on the long and bumpy journey it took to get here and never forget that we can accomplish nothing alone. Thank you all. Sharing a proper greeting and a farewell are quite significant in Jewish tradition. It is a spiritual act to arrive and a spiritual act to depart. For when one arrives or departs, there is potential for transformation. In fact, most of our greetings in Hebrew that mark these moments are not just statements or questions, they are actually blessings. Wishing someone good morning is wishing them a morning filled with light. Welcoming someone is to express gratitude for their being and arrival. I have been given the task of sending you on your way with a final benediction. Calling upon my tradition informs me not just to say farewell, but to wish you well. I'd like to pause and reflect on the spiritual meaning of this moment. What does this moment of farewell mean? What is its potential? How does one leave? The Talmud, one of our earliest Jewish legal texts, teaches, one who takes leave of his friend should say, Lech l'shalom, go to peace rather than lech bishalom, go in peace, which you might hear more commonly. There is a difference in saying lech bishalom, go in peace, versus lech lishalom, go to peace. The difference lies in one small Hebrew letter. 
With each of these expressions being grammatically correct, the difference seems relatively minor. Although maybe not to an attorney who observes and scrutinizes every word or letter. In this case, one letter makes a big difference. The former, bishalom, go in peace, is passive, implying that one will go with peace, remaining idle, already having achieved their destination. To wish someone that they go to peace is to bless them with a journey, to pray that their life continually move in the direction of wholeness. Such is my prayer and wish for you. So I invite you, if you are able, to rise as we ask for God's blessing upon you. God, master of the universe, creator of all things, source of life, mercy, and love, known by many names, who has spoken to all people in all times through an abundance of prophets. We gratefully acknowledge your presence with us here this morning. Today, we celebrate the Boston College Law School graduates of 2019, who journey on to new endeavors with distinction. We thank you for the opportunity to learn and grow. On this day of celebration, we reflect on our accomplishments, on our tasks partly completed, on challenges met, on failures unexpected, on spurts of creative energy and moments of stagnation, on disappointments and surprises, on cherished relationships, on the passage of time. Together, we ask for your blessing. May we appreciate and recognize the reward that has come from studying many hours, reading countless pages, writing innumerable briefs and papers. May we understand our work as holy, learning, teaching, researching, collaborating, questioning, serving the community. May we recognize your hand, O oh God, in helping us to accomplish what was at one time a distant dream. It is you who are the source of our courage and strength. It is you who instills a sense of justice within us. It is you who inspires us to pursue passions that burn deep within. It is you, O oh God, who teach us to serve humankind and to be your partners in the creation of the world as it should be. Holy One, these graduates and students of the law have arrived to this day because they put forth the effort. But we celebrate this day because you have sustained them and guided them with love. We are grateful for the people you have brought into their lives, for they have been instructed by wise and compassionate professors, guided by skilled administrators, and blessed by the love and support of mentors, friends, and family. As they journey on, we pray that you will give them the strength and moral conviction to act with their best intentions, the confidence to use the knowledge and skills they have acquired, and serious determination to overcome difficulty and even despair. As we confront the complicated and divisive challenges of state and society, may we remain ever faithful to you as we pursue justice and well-being for those we serve. Graduates, I pray, on your sacred journey, may God bless you and keep you. May God's presence shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God lift God's face to meet yours, granting you God's most precious gift of wholeness, of meaning, of shalom. May your name and your legacy be worthy of God's blessing. Lech le shalom. Now go forth to peace. And let us all say, Amen. You may be seated. This concludes our commencement exercises for the class of 2019. I invite all of you to join us after these uh, exercises in the concourse for a reception and finally, congratulations once again to the class of 2019.